are in chapter, uh, chapter 21. <clears throat> uh, before we get into the chapter itself, I want to remind ourselves of our outline as we do each uh, class period that we're following on, on the book of Acts. Uh, we divide the book down into two major sections, the Gospel of Palestine, 1 through 12, and the Gospel of the Uttermost Parts of the World, 13 through uh, 28. Uh, we're in that second section, and for some time, uh, that continues from 13 through the end of the book. Uh, but even though we're in that second main section, we are in a little bit of a change when it comes to the subsections of, of uh, this particular section of the book. Uh, again, we look at our outlines like we do each of the chapters. We have the main point, and then we may have some, uh, some sub-points uh, under that. And so there are uh, five subsections to this final section on the gospel of the most parts of the world. Uh, the first journey, 13 and 14. 15, the Jerusalem discussion about circumcision. Uh, I'm on page uh, 7 of your workbook. You can look at it in your workbook. You have the subsections up to this outline. The second journey, 16 through 18. The third journey, 19 through 20. And then in chapter 21, uh, Paul's trials and journey to, to Rome. If you want to get more specific, uh, it's easier to remember in those round chapters, 21 through the end, is the journey to Rome, uh, the trials and journey to Rome. If you want to get more specific, it's beginning in verse 18 of chapter 21, is really that dramatic shift as the first 17 verses focus on the end of the third journey. And then in chapter 21, 18, where we discuss uh, on uh, Sunday morning, is that shift to that final section of Paul's trials and his journey. Uh, journey to Rome. Uh, this is the outline or the, the map that we've looked at of uh, this third journey. Uh, if you look at the red line, that's the outbound journey. And then Paul makes a shift when he gets to Corinth up here on the, uh, what would be on the left hand side of the screen for you. Uh, when he gets to Corinth, he makes a shift and journeys back. Uh, that would be the black line uh, on the color map. Uh, in your workbook, it would be a lighter darker line will tell you the point of which, uh, which is which. Uh, but the first half of the chapter that we're in is the end of this journey Paul comes from Elias over to Jerusalem uh, at the end of the chapter. Uh, in fact, the chapter 21 is just two major sections. Uh, from Elias to Jerusalem in 1 through 17, and then 18 through 40, Paul is arrested in, uh, in Jerusalem. And that journey from my leaders, we saw that last Wednesday evening. Uh, in 1 through 3, uh, Paul sails from my leaders to Tyre. He stays there with the disciples for, uh, for seven days. Uh, in 4 through 6, it's then in chapter 7, he comes to Caesarea and stays with Philip the Evangelist. He is one of the six, uh, that we are one of the seven, uh, that we were introduced to in chapter 6. Uh, we are reintroduced him in chapter 8 when he teaches the Samaritans. He's the one involved in the conversion of Simon the Sorcerer. And then he teaches the Ethiopian eunuch. So 20 years or so have passed from the events of chapter 8 and the conversion of the eunuch to the events of chapter uh, chapter 21 where we are reintroduced to Philip. Uh, but it is brought up that Philip uh, has uh, four virgin daughters uh, that prophesy in the earlier part of chapter 21. Uh, he went, by the way, to Caesarea. If you go back to chapter 8, he says he makes for Caesarea as he leaves for the unit. So he would have been in Caesarea working with this church here, it would appear, for those the duration of 20 years. Then he went straight to Caesarea from the conversion of the unit, and that's where we find him 20, uh, 20 years later. Uh, we brought up previously, it does tell us something about the character of him. Then we'll draw the unit. The job he did as, as a father in uh, teaching his children that they could learn, uh, learn the truth and uh, come to uh, be these uh, daughters that prophesy, as well as the fact that they are first daughters. He taught them about purity. Uh, I've noted already, but if you have an English Standard Version, some others I think translated this way as well, uh, back in verse number. Uh, earlier in chapter 21, in verse number uh, 9, it says he had four unmarried daughters. As we've already pointed out, that's 
translation. He did not form unmarried. Uh, they were unmarried, but that's not the focal point. One can be, as we already pointed out, one can be unmarried and not be a, a virgin. These were for, for virgin uh, daughters. So it's not just the fact they were unmarried. Uh, they had been keeping themselves, uh, keeping themselves pure and saving themselves uh, for, uh, for marriage. It's what Paul and Caesar read, that we are reintroduced to man by the name of Agnes. He was brought up uh, briefly in chapter uh, 11, uh, and he's the one that foretold of the hardships that were going to take place in Judea, and the famine that was going to take place uh, in chapter 11, where there were those who gave to help, uh, to help the needy saints at the end of chapter 11. Uh, he, he's reintroduced here, and he comes to Caesarea uh, from the area of Judea, and he takes his up to Paul, binds his hands and his feet, and says that the Holy Spirit said that the Jews would bind the hands, uh, or bind the man who owned that belt uh, when he came to Jerusalem and hand him over to, uh, to the Gentiles, uh, being that he's telling about Paul. Uh, there were those who were there who pleaded with Paul, don't go. Paul was going to go anyway, so they said the Lord's will be done. It's then in verse 15 through 17 that Paul journeys his way down to Jerusalem, where in verse 17 he's glad to receive by those that are there. Verse 18 then, we've already discussed 18 through 32 uh, on, on Sunday. I want to quickly review that because that's the work that we pick up and continue into uh, the next chapter. 18 to 25, first and foremost, uh, Paul comes before James and before the elders that are. In Jerusalem. Uh, and there are four things that are discussed there. He comes first in 18 through 19 and he reports of the work that he has done among the Gentiles to those that are, uh, to the elders and to James. He related how God, uh, he related one by one of the things God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. And so hearing this, uh, James and the elders at Jerusalem greatly uh, rejoiced and they glorified God, verse 20. But uh, they also had to tell Paul in 20 through 22 that there is some misunderstanding uh, among some of the Jewish brethren. There are those, there are many thousands in verse 20, who are from among the Jews who have believed and are zealous for the law. Now as we've already noted, they're not saying these are zealous for the law in the sense that these are wanting to go back and bind the old law. Rather, these are those Jews who wanted to keep themselves the customs. They were binding, not like Acts 15. But they themselves wanted to keep some of the customs, some of the vows that we see brought up here in the text. Uh, perhaps they, there were certain meats they didn't want to eat, or perhaps they felt they couldn't work on the Sabbath day. Even though that was not binding, they felt there were some customs of the Jews they needed to keep. They were under the impression, or some things they had heard, that Paul was teaching the Jews who live among the Gentiles, or are among the Gentiles, that they cannot keep these customs. In particular, uh, circumcision is the one brought up in verse, uh, verse 21. So they're hearing that, that what Paul is saying is, you cannot keep the customs. Not that you don't have to. Not that you can't bind it. They were wanting to bind it. And they knew they didn't have to keep it, but some of them felt like they should because it's what they've always done, even though that law was taken out of the way. They wouldn't feel right not keeping those customs. And they were under the impression that Paul had said they couldn't. And so uh, the elders here suggest to Paul, as we pointed out on Sunday, I think very wisely, that because he believes the customs can be kept, uh, that he go before men there who were under a vow, one of these vows that was a custom, a vow similarly, by the way, is something Paul had already done, pointed out a few chapters previous. In uh, chapter uh, 18, I believe it is, it is pointed out that Paul had kept a vow. Yes, 18, 18. Uh, he had shaved his head was under a vow. Uh, we like it the same vow we're talking about, uh, the same vow these men are under. And so the suggestion is, Paul, why don't you go with them? You purify yourself along with them. You pay their expenses. So by doing so, you can show to the Jews that think you say you can't keep it. No, I do believe you can keep it. And as we pointed out, uh, and that it proved two things. One, that he believed you could, the river was, was wrong. He wasn't saying you cannot keep it. You cannot buy it. We know that. Paul talks about that. But you can keep these customs for the G 
proves it here, uh, because that's what Paul had learned, even though he was a Christian for some time, versus somebody down the road uh, whose, whose parents were Christians, grandparents had been Christians, wouldn't have grown up doing the same things, at least not knowing they were thinking they were finding. They might have done them with their parents saying, you don't have to do this, but being that, and explaining, then they cried perhaps, uh, knowing they were under the new power to not go back, back to their son. Yes. Even after Paul was always with the synagogue, stop the Jews. On the Sabbath. Even after he said, I'm going to wash my hands, that he goes to the Gentiles. But if you look at the next chapter, he goes right back to the synagogue. And he does a couple of churches. Yes, you know, and it is interesting to go through, even though Paul's primary work is on Gentiles, any city where there's a synagogue, so Paul goes, he talks to the Jews first, the Jews reject and he turns to the Gentiles. Which I think he's showing us, he's going to point out in chapter. Yeah. 
Levite present had they for sure seen him uh, in the temple, uh, which would have hindered many people from obeying the gospel probably by that reaction. Because they say, why should we listen to this man? He doesn't even respect us. Versus later on, Paul shows that he's been where they are and comes. He doesn't engage the audience until he gets to that key word, Gentiles, again, uh, later on. So that would, uh, that would be the biggest problem with it, would be the laws out of effect, the fact that it would have made it I don't want to say nearly impossible, but very, very difficult to be effective with anybody present that might have listened to him. And it might have even offended probably with some of the brethren who were there that he would even do uh, such a thing if he had taken a Gentile into the temple uh, and made them uh, in, in that situation uh, as well. Verse 33 now, 33 through 36. The trip, when the tribune, and then the tribune came, arrested him, and ordered him to be bound with two chains. He inquired who he was and what he had done. Some of the crowd were shouting one thing, some another. And as he could not learn the facts before, because the uproar, he ordered him to be brought to the fairs. And when he came to the steps, he actually cared, was carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the crowd, for the mob of people followed crying away with him. So, uh, the chief leader is trying to find out what's going on, trying to inquire from Paul, or trying to inquire what's going on, who he is and what he's done. And the crowd, half the crowd shouted one thing and half the crowd shouted another. Similar to what happened uh, when Paul was in Ephesus. People were never more there. Uh, and they were in confusion. Some of the Jews were shouting one thing, some were shouting another. Uh, perhaps going back to the church, some of them were shouting, He took a Gentile into the temple. And the others were shouting, He speaks out against the law of Moses. Perhaps some others shouting, He speaks out against the temple. Uh, so uh, that seems to be, uh, whatever it is, the crowds are shouting it. At least a few different things uh, to the point that the, the, the uh, tribute can't get an answer because of the mass chaos going on from the people that are present. So he orders they take Paul into the barracks, uh, hoping when he gets in there he can get some answers as to what exactly the charges that they're bringing against Paul are as to why they're trying, trying to, be, to be here. Uh, they had to carry Paul, verse 35, in the barracks because of the violence of the crowd, and the crowd continued to shout away with, uh, away with him. But after this, they're on their way. Paul is about to be brought into the barracks, and he says to the tribune, verse 37, May I say something to you? And he said, Do you know Greek? Are you not the Egyptian then who recently stirred up a revolt and led the 4,000 men to the assassin, uh, assassins out into the wilderness? Paul replied, I am a Jew from Tarsus in Sicilia, a citizen of no obscure city. I beg you, permit me to speak to the people. And when he gave him permission, Paul standing on the steps, motioned with his hand to the people. When there was a great class, he addressed them in the Hebrew language of saying, between chapter 22 here in just a second. Um, as they're bringing Paul out here, uh, they're bringing him in, he wants to address those that are present uh, in the crowd of Jews that are making the accusations against him. And, <coughs> excuse me, he uh, asked the tribune to speak. The commander of the tribune uh, was curious about his ability to speak Greek. He thought he was the Egyptian revolutionary that led the Jewish rebellion against him. Roman rulers. Uh, there have been some years before, this is noted in your, in your workbook near the end of the text, uh, two paragraphs before the questions in, in lesson 20. But some years before, an Egyptian li uh, led his followers, 4,000 according to Lysias, into the wilderness. He had convinced them in the belief that the walls of Jerusalem would fall out at his command, much like Jericho's walls fell in Joshua's day. His plan was to then overpower the Roman rulers of Jerusalem. It was a disaster. But the ringleader, this Egyptian, had escaped. And the commander seemed to be assuming that Paul was the leader, perhaps because he spoke Greek and the Egyptian Jews spoke Greek. Uh, so the thought is perhaps that he is, um, perhaps he is uh, this Egyptian leader. And Paul points out, no, I'm not this, uh, this Egyptian that led the revolt. In fact, I'm a Jew. Uh, I'm from Tarsus. It's not, you know, it's not a pure city. Uh, and so permit me to speak to to speak to this crowd. So he was permitted uh, by the tribune, and after he gave permission, Paul motioned with his hands, and then a great hush fell upon the crowd. Uh, and Paul began to speak in the Hebrew language. And as we'll see in chapter 22, we won't get this far uh, likely in the next few moments this evening. But they listen very intently to what Paul has to say until he says that one word uh, in Gentiles that turns the crowd. Uh, the crowd against them. But up to that point, they are very listening. They are very engaged with what Paul was having to say and listening to him through the uh, the next part of uh, the text. 
taken right up where we left off in the previous chapter. I mean, chapter, the previous chapter says uh, he began saying, and then chapter, the next chapter begins with exactly what Paul, uh, Paul said uh, to them. Paul deals really with three things uh, in this speech. Go ahead and turn to your next work, uh, next uh, lesson, uh, lesson 21, chapter 22. Paul really deals with three uh, three things uh, in in this uh, this lesson. He deals with his life before his conversion. He deals with his conversion, and then he deals with the fact that he was commanded or called to preach to uh, to the Gentiles. Uh, and so those are the three main points to his sermon. One to five is conversion, or his life before conversion, six to sixteen conversion. And then 17 through 21, the call to preach to, uh, to the Gentiles. Life before conversion, 1 through 5. Brothers and fathers, hear the defense that I now make before you. When they heard that he was addressing them in the Hebrew language, they became even more quiet. And he said, I am a Jew born in Tarsus and Cilicia, but brought up in this city, educated at the feet of Melody, according to the strict manner of the law of our fathers, being zealous for God, as all of you are to the, or this day. I persecuted this way to the dead, binding and delivering to prison both men and women. As the high priest and the whole council of elders can bear me witness, for that from them I received letters to the brothers, and I journeyed toward Damascus to take those also who were there and bring them in bonds to Jerusalem to be, to be punished. So Paul points out here in the early part of 1 through 3, he says, listen, uh, as they're coming after him, uh, I think part of the being response to the fact that he brought, was supposedly brought the Gentile into the, uh, Gentile into the temple, along with his speaking against the law. Paul points out, listen, I was brought up the same way you were. Uh, in fact, not only was he brought up under the strictness of the law, he <laughs> learned at the feet of Gamaliel, somebody well respected among the Jews. Uh, you go back to uh, to chapter 5, if you remember chapter 5, when we were introduced when, when Gamaliel mentioned, here we have the people. Or the Sanhedrin Council, where Gamaliel was a part of this, who are wanting to, to harm or kill the apostles. After they had taught them, uh, they had killed the late man in chapter 3, Peter and John had, chapter 4, they had told them, don't preach anymore in the name of this Jesus. And then, uh, chapter 5, they were, they brought them in, and then the men were let go, and they finally preaching again. And so some of them, let's just get rid of them. And it's Gamaliel. Who stands up and says, Listen, if this is from man, then give it time and it'll sort of fizzle out, if you will. Yeah. There's been other times that somebody rose up claiming to be somebody, gathered with our scholars, they died, and then you gave us, we give us some time and that died out. He says, So if this is from man, it's going to sort of fizzle out. If it's from God, we're not going to find it anymore. Now, that's one man standing up to the council and saying, here's what we should do. All the rest of them seem to be warning to put them to death. And yet, those present, he did by some day. I say that to say, it shows the respect that those on the Sanhedrin, uh, Jewish, a lot of the leaders among the Jews, had for Gamaliel. So Paul, coming up at the feet of Gamaliel, being educated at his feet, and according to the strict manner of the laws, uh, the law of our fathers, as he said, uh, shows something to them about the kind of upbringing he had concerning the law. He then points out in verse 3, not only was he brought up that way, he was zealous for God as all of them were. Paul, Paul, Paul is saying here, listen, they don't understand that that law was taken out of the way. What they do need to understand is this. It, or what Paul understands is this. If the old law was still in effect, and Paul had been speaking against it, and Paul had taken the Gentile into the temple, he would have violated the law. And they would have had a right to be mad about that. And they think that law still, there's some of them that think that law still binds them. Right? They haven't learned yet. Now they're starting to learn some, unfortunately not enough. They, they still turn it to Paul again later on. But Paul's pointing out, listen, you're being zealous for the law. I was where you are right now. He said, and he proves it to them. He, he says, going back, he says, that I persecuted this way. That is the very thing I am teaching. That you are now saying, hey, we don't, uh, he's speaking against Moses and against this place. The very thing that you're wanting to persecute me for teaching, he said, there was a time I persecuted those who taught and believed the same thing you're, you're, you're not happy with me about teaching. He goes up, there was a time that I did that. He says, 
fact, but when he's converted, before he's converted, he's actually on his way with letters to take those that are towards Damascus and to put them into bonds, uh, to take them and bring them in bonds to Jerusalem so that they can be punished. So Paul points out to the crowd here, before he goes any further to talk about being converted in Christ, and say, listen, I've been where you are. I've been zealous for the law to the point that I was a persecutor of the church. But then he comes on and points out that there was something that changed in 6 through 16, and that would be the appearance of uh, Lord him all the way to the road of Damascus. Verse 6, beginning now. As I was on my way, to draw near to Damascus, about noon, the great light from heaven suddenly shone around me. And I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And I answered, Who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. Now those who were with me saw the light, but did not understand the voice of the one who was speaking to me. And I said, What shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, Rise and go into Damascus. And there you will be told all that is appointed for you to do. And since I could not see, because of the brightness of the, that light, I was led by the hand, uh, by the hand, by those who were with me, and came to Damascus. And one and nine, a devout man, according to the law, well spoken of by all the Jews who lived there, came to me and standing by me, said to me, "Brother Saul, receive your sign." And at that very hour, I received my sign and saw him. And he said, The God of our fathers appointed you to know his will, to see the righteous one, and to hear a voice from his mouth. For you will be a witness for him to everyone of what you have seen and heard. And now why do you wait? Rise, be baptized, and wash away your sins, calling on his name. So Paul points out, uh, in, the, in the first section, I was on the way to Damascus. I have been persecuted in the church. I was on the way to Damascus to buy more people and bring them back to Jerusalem. But on that road, he says, the Lord appeared to me. On that road to Damascus. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? What well, Paul's pointing out to them here is that he was where they were, and it wasn't for, and, and there was a, a dramatic change. Something that happened to cause such a shift in his life. And he's pointing out that on the road to Damascus, that he sees his bright light, and there the Lord is before him. There's Jesus. There's the one whom he's persecuting. Saul, Saul, why are, uh, are you persecuting me? That's when he points out, after he asked who he was, that I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. And so Paul is pointing out to them here, that he's on his way to persecute, but something happens and that the Lord appears to him. And because of that, as he hears this voice, he's told to go into Damascus and there will be told to him what he needs to do to be saved. So a man by the name of Ananias, a respected man among the Jews, comes to him and teaches him. He tells him what he needs to do to be saved. He talks about how God had chosen Paul to be a witness to the Gentiles. He points out more later on about turning to the Gentiles. He doesn't use that term just yet. But he points out about the call and how he's to testify and to preach and be a witness of the things that you see for, uh, for Christ to everyone. That would be both Jews and Greeks. Of what he has seen and what he has heard. And so, that's what verse 16 happens. Why are you waiting? Why do you wait? Saul, you, you realize now that Christ indeed died and was risen from the dead, that what has taken place is true. You've now heard what you need to do. Saul, don't wait any longer. And so Saul responds in obedience to the gospel. And then in 17 to 21, we'll pick up next time, that Saul points.